You're listening to Jazz After Nine. My name is Neil Colligan, and I'm very glad to welcome in studio tonight Derek Gardner, who is uh, the Associate Professor of Jazz Trumpet at the University of Manitoba's Jazz Program. And uh, Derek, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah. Now, there's an official title to that uh, that gig you've got there, and we should never forget sponsors, so give oh, it yeah, to me. Yeah. I, am the, uh, I am the Babs Asper Professor of Jazz Performance and Jazz Trumpet. Okay. There you go. Thank you the, yeah. to the late Mrs. Asper, for yeah. sure, and the Asper family. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're here tonight to talk about uh, a, a project that you and Steve Kirby are uh, putting together called the Big Dig Band. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's give, give me the lowdown on that. Well, um, this is a, uh, an ensemble of uh, the large ensemble format, uh, classic uh, big band instrumentation of uh, uh, eight brass, which is four trumpets, four trombones, and five saxophones, and piano, bass, drums, guitar, and a vocalist, actually, as well. Um, and uh, it's patterned after the uh, Mingus Dynasty uh, big band workshops of uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, as was done in New York City back during that time. And uh, what would happen is that uh, when they would perform uh, uh, those pieces, and those were like uh, uh, newly arranged uh, pieces of, of uh, Mingus's works during uh, with that with that ensemble. Um, the workshop part of it was that during the performance, if if uh, they uh, uh, had to had to stop the band and and, and rehearse something, they stop mid performance and rehearse the band, you know, and uh, and it became a thing, you know, because it. Uh, all of a sudden, it included the audience into the the uh, preparation, uh, the process of preparation for getting getting uh, the music together for an ensemble of that size, and um, so it was very loose and it was it was it was uh, um, very edgy at the time because you know Mingus's music was you know very edgy from the from the onset you know, and um, uh, but it was it it. it what it really did was it gave an audience uh, insight into the uh, uh, the uh, rehearsal process, the creative process of of musicians, which they which uh, audiences very rarely get to see because they usually get to see a finished product. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what makes what makes uh, uh, this band uh, uh, unique in that we're bringing this uh, that type of concept here to Winnipeg. Yeah, and certainly uh, classical music orchestras will do that sometimes. They'll say, hey, you want to see how we put together Beethoven's Fifth? You mm. come in for the rehearsal, we'll show it to you, and then you come by later tonight or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of like the same idea, except it's all happening in the same evening there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's happening as a, this is, uh, the rehearsal is also the finished product that you that you're seeing simultaneously, you know. Okay. And it really puts um, puts the the musicians on top of their toes, you know, because um you know, it, it's not necessarily um all that entertaining for an audience to sit through a a a, a, a long and dragged out, you know, musicians rehearsal. That's not because they're, you know, they they they're there to enjoy themselves and be entertained. So, mm -hmm. um it's not going to be um uh, 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 that much of 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 that. There's not going to be a large percentage of of rehearsal. There will be the part that keeps us on our toes is that okay, guys from uh, rehearsal letter D, can we look at that real quick? Saxophones, just run that real quick, you know. Then we'll run it, and then brass at letter H, can we run that real quick? Boom, run it one time. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Here we go. One, two, three, four, bam, and then we'll run the run the thing down, you know. So, how many compositions an evening would it be? Uh, we haven't uh, got the entire equation down yet, but I'm thinking around maybe six or seven. Okay. Something like that. So if you have to stop things, yeah. work it over a bit and stuff like that, it isn't mm -hmm. all dominating the evening that way. Right, yeah. right, right. And well, the, the, how we've, how we've kind of configured it is that this is two sets. Uh, the first set is the, the workshop portion. And um, uh, then the second set is a full run-through of the music that we did in the first set 
um, which will be like the finished the finished product. So if you don't want to take part in the workshop, which I know starts at eight o'clock in the evening, yeah. uh, you can come for the finished product at nine thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've got plenty of experience with big band. I noticed that in your resume, we're talking about uh, the latter day Count Basie band uh, when Frank Foster took it over. Sure. As well as uh, Harry Connick uh, Jr.'s uh, big band as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that experience. Well, how, how did that help to develop you? Well, um, the thing that uh, I guess the the ensemble that really uh, truly helped me was uh, uh, being in the Count Basie Orchestra with Frank Foster. And um, as a as a, a composer arranger, especially as an arranger, um, I was uh, in between sit in the middle of a tour and in between cities we'd be on the bus and um uh frank would be in the front seat of the bus with a big uh pad of score paper and a, a black felt tip pen and and he'd be you know, big band score paper with all the parts and everything and he'd go uh saxophones dee da dee da dee da Brass, de da de da da trombones, de da de da de da. Yeah, next 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 line, de da de, and he's uh, writing. What's this direction? V vertically, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and I'm looking at him. I said, man, he's writing an, an arrangement and voicing, coming up with the voice, the the voicings in his head. No piano, nothing, you know, with yeah, a, yeah. with a with ink. And I said, wow, that's incredible. I said, well, maybe, well, maybe I can do that. You know, so <laughs> I, would buy, I would buy some score paper, and um, and I said, okay, saxophones, d da d da, does brand trumpets, d da d da d. So I had a couple pages finished, you know, and I said, so one day I went to the front of the bus, and uh, I said, hey, Foss, man, would you? Um, I've been working on something, man. Would you take a look at this, man? And he said, so he was working on his own stuff. And he gave it to him. He looked at it, and said. Hmm, okay, yeah. So he had his and he had his black felt tip pen. And he started doing this. He took the cap off the black felt tip pen. Said, mm hmm Put that in his pocket. Then grabbed the red pen. Took the cap off. Put, in the, put that in the pocket. And he said, "Why'd you do this here? That's all wrong, you know." This <laughs> <laughs> started. He said, "Do this like that's, that's B flat. That's be B natural day because you got the thing here. The third doesn't work here. You know, we got to put the third up here. You got to do this in the fifth. And so he just started just doing this zero thing all over my, just bleeding all over my page, you know, with this red pen. And then he gave it back to me. I said, "Okay, here, here, take that back and work on it." And I just looked at it. <laughs> just had all this blood on my page. You know? <laughs> so I walked back to the back of the bus, you know, tail between my legs. And when I got to the to the hotel. Um, if they had a piano, or when I got to the gig, I would go to the piano and just, you know, kind of work out the voicings that he put, you know, make the corrections. And so maybe a couple weeks later, I'd make the corrections and get a little further along in the piece, take it back up to Fawcett. Frank, would you take a look at this, you know? <laughs> and he said, they took the red pen out again. He said, okay, well, all right, well, this is pretty good here. All right, that's all right. That's good. Okay, that's a good job there. Okay, well, this is wrong. You shouldn't have done that, you know. And uh, so each time I went back to the front of the bus, I had less red ink on my on my score paper, you know. And that was one of the huge um, lessons, you know, in, in arranging, you know, just hands-on, you know. And I got to the point where I was able to uh, turn out a couple of arrangements for the Basie Band uh, that we played uh, on tour, you know, and um, so uh, uh, so so that's what uh, that was. Those were that was one of the big things that really got me started. Okay, yeah. and uh, of course these days uh, that is also part of what you do with the University of Manitoba Jazz Program as well as bring those skills as an arranger to the proceedings. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, with this project here, I mean, obviously some people are going to be thinking, you know, I, I know about the Winnipeg Jazz Orchestra, yeah. right? And I go to see their concerts. How is this different? Now, we have explained the fact that you're kind of workshopping this thing, that yeah. you're kind of working it out in front of people. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the music you're also going to tackle is a little different, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we fo we're focusing on original music, and it's uh, this whole thing is a composer's jam session. You know, when you, when you think of a jam session, you think of of uh, musicians showing up with their instruments 
and they pull out their instruments and they play and they jam with each, with each other. Well, this is the same thing, but people show up with their scores, and um, <clears throat> and it's not going to be it's not going to be so loose where where a person just walks in the door with their score. We, there has to be some there have to be some uh, a number of meetings prior to the to each each performance so that we can take a look at the score and see where it would fit in the programming and see if it you know um, uh, if we'd be able to be able to uh, to do it for the next you know uh, scheduled uh, performance. Uh, but it is uh, uh, is an outlet for jazz composers uh, in big band instrumentation uh, for the city of Winnipeg or in the whoever in the surrounding area uh, that, that in Winnipeg. Then they write and they want to hear something and they just have to be in town. You know, talk to us and, and let's see if we can play it. You know. Yeah. Well, certainly a new creative outlet. Yeah. 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 yeah most definitely. And uh, and it and you know in order to uh, uh, to do something like this uh, would normally take uh, quite a bit of uh, time and effort and and expense. You know, you have to rent uh, a place to rehearse. You know, you have to get all the musicians together. And 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 uh, if they have, uh, I know, you know, coming from New York when I was living there, and you had to pay, you had to pay cast to rehearse. You know, you had to pay for the rehearsal space and you had to pay for all this stuff. And so. Um, here we have uh, a big band that is here ready to play, and um, and we get to discover some new music as well. Uh, the more entertaining, uh, well, we hope that, that the whole thing is entertaining, but uh, we will be playing some uh, uh, pre-existing material uh, that the uh, uh, jazz enthusiasts may or may not be familiar with. Um, like some, I have quite a bit of Frank Foster's uh, music from his, uh, the Loud Minority Big Band, and I have quite a few of a uh, very obscure Thad Jones uh, uh, arrangements uh, from the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra that people may not be familiar with, but that music really deserves to be heard. You know, well, it's already been battle tested, so to speak. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And those are just a few, just a, a couple of the of the composers uh, that you know we'll be featuring. You know? Okay, well, I, I wish you guys all the best with this, and uh, what I am looking forward to is you guys get to the point that you're able to put some of this into a recording, if you can. Yes, yes. Oh, well, that's that's definitely um, in the, not hopefully not so far future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to do two things here. Uh, one, as I want to remind uh, those of you out there listening to this, uh, that the Big Dig Band, this venture, gets underway on Thursday, January 16th, and it's going to be at a new location that you may not have, you may remember it as uh, Pop Soda, but uh, it's at 625 Portage Avenue. It's now called Goodwill. Prices, uh, you can't go wrong. It's only five bucks. Five bucks for a big band. You know, yeah, for what sure. a bargain. Yeah. And so, and uh, once again, as uh, Derek was saying there, uh, you can either come at eight for the workshop or mm -hmm. you can come at 9 30 for the concert. So, once mm -hmm. again, that's uh, the Goodwill at 625 Portage on Thursday night, five bucks at the door. I want to end off uh, with one of your own works here. This comes uh, from a, a long term project for you, the mm -hmm. uh, Derek Gardner and the Jazz Prophets. Uh, this is from an album called A Ride to the Other Side of Infinity. I want, can you set this up briefly for us here? Yeah, uh, well, that was a, um, uh, a project that I did uh, back in, uh, uh, we released that in 2007, I believe. And um, the, title, it, the, the title of the project is not anything that's, um, uh, that's, that's real cerebral or transcendental or whatever. You know, it's uh, literally a, 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 a really good drummer friend of mine named Randy Gillespie. Uh, he used to be the drummer with... Um, with uh, uh, West Montgomery uh, back in the 60s. Um, uh, we were leaving a, 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 a gig, and the bass player's car was on the other side of the complex. And so Randy's car was right there. And he was like, uh, and so the bass player asked Randy, said, hey, man, give me, can you give me a ride, a ride to my car? He said, yeah, I'll give you a ride. I'll I, I give you a ride to the other side. And I was right there. I said, you know, man, that is slick. What did you just say? A ride to the other side. Yeah, ride to the other side. So, I mean, I'm going to use that. That's that's where I got the title from. And then um, my saxophone player that's on that record, his name is Robert Dixon. Um, he had a, he wrote this tune that he wanted to include on the project, and um, he didn't have a, a title for it. He usually doesn't name his tunes until it's time to uh, 
uh, do the post production for the CD, you know. And I said, Rob, I need a title for your tune, you know. And he said, oh, Okay, okay, let me think about it. So he thought about the title that I came up with, and he said, Of Infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add to the sentence, and so uh, that's the, and and it fit, it you know, fits. and it fit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, this uh, Derek, thank you very much for coming by this evening. We're going to end off tonight uh, with Derek Gardner and the Jazz Prophets uh, from the album "A Ride to the Other Side of Infinity." Thank there you, you very much for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure.